Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church's online worship service for this Sunday, March 14th, 2021. I'm Relay Reader Zach Hosner. I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service, which can be found in the link below the in the description below the video on Facebook and on YouTube, or you can check our website, www.centralprespb.com. Uh, look for the publications link, scroll down until you see today's date, go ahead and click on that link and it will download the PDF for today's bulletin, which can be read on mobile devices and tablets, or you can print that uh, bulletin out so you can follow along during today's service. Um, now that you have the bulletin for today's service, I ask that you uh, turn your attention to the announcements found on the last page of the bulletin. Uh, the One Great Hour Sharing offering will be taken up on April 4th. This offering helps support Presbyterian disaster assistance, the Presbyterian hunger program, and the self-development of people. Uh, for more, more information, you can check out our website. Uh, Central Presbyterian Church will be holding an egg hunt for the children on Palm Sunday at 1 p.m. at the church. Uh, this will be an outdoor event, and more details uh, will come uh, on our social media channels and uh, on our uh, next service next week. The session of CPCS decided to continue to stick with virtual services for the foreseeable future. Keep in contact us with keep in contact with us via social media and, or on our website for any announcements about any special services and when we plan on resuming in-person worship. Our username on social media is Central Prez PB. Archives of our online services can be found on Facebook and on YouTube. Links to each are on our website, centralprespb.com. One last announcement that's not on the bulletin is that um, I, I, I ask you to uh, forgive me this week. Um, Tim was not able to record the sermon, um, so I will be delivering it this week. Um, because I'm going to be doing so much reading, I'm going to have to keep my glasses on. So if the reflection of my monitors or the light in the room distracts you, I do apologize. With that, let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Lord. We give you thanks, O God, for you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever. When we cried to you with our troubles, O Lord, you saved us from our distress. We give you thanks, O God, for your wonderful works to all of humanity. Hear now our offerings of praise and thanksgiving as we tell of your deeds with songs of joy. Let us worship God. If we claim that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In humility and faith, let us confess our sins to God, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin and then silently. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained <clears throat> and great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And now silently. Amen. Hear the good news. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Now let's go ahead and turn it over uh, for this week's children's sermon to Rose von Tunglen. Good morning, everyone. I hope you've had a good week. It's been a long week for us here at my house with Bradley in the hospital, but he's coming home today and he's much better. So today I thought I would talk about God's love. And you know, I was wondering if we could measure God's love, because you know, the Bible verse says that God so loved the world, so maybe we could measure his love. So let's start out with a measuring cup. You know, you use a measuring cup, to measure flour or milk or sugar when you're baking something, so why not measure God's love in this? But wait a minute, let's see what the Bible says about this. And this is found in Psalms, verses, <clears throat> chapter 23, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. 
Uh, well, I guess if the cup runs over, then we're not going to be able to measure God's love with that, are we? Okay, so how about a measuring tape? You know, we use a measuring tape to see how tall we are, or if we're going to make something, we might need to measure it to make sure that it's the right length, or who knows what you can measure. You can measure anything, so I bet we can measure God's love with this. But again, let's see what the Bible says. <clears throat> the Bible says in Psalms 108, verse 4, For your mercy is great above the heavens, and your truth reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and your glory above all the earth. Hmm. I don't know about y'all, but I don't think my measuring tape's going to reach to the heavens. So I guess we can't measure God's love that way either. Okay, I got one more thing I think we can use to measure God's love, and that's my watch. That we can measure how much time God gives to us and how much love he shows to us by using our watch. You know, we time a lot of things, how much things cost. Anyway, the Bible says, though, on verse 17 on Psalms 103, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. Hmm, my watch is not going to keep time that long. But let us remember that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Wow, that's a lot of love that God gives to us, isn't it? So let's remember that no matter how much you think you can measure God's love, it's endless. His, his love is forever. It's deep and wide, and our cup runs us over with his love. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are here today to show us your love. We ask that you will watch over us, keep us safe, and help us to show others your love. Amen. Thank you, Rose. Uh, today's first scripture reading is from Numbers, uh, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Listen for the word of the Lord. From Mount Hor, they set up by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents along, along, among the people, and they bit the people and so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent, and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Today's second scripture reading is from Ephesians ch uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Again, listen for the word of the Lord. You are dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived. Following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, uh, uh, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and when we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, to be our way of life. Excuse me. Today's third reading is from the, uh, of the book of John, 
uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Once again, we'll listen for the word of the Lord. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, our uh, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear. In hearing, we might believe, and in believing, we might live lives richer and fuller in service to you, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Years ago, I came across a rather beautiful story about an artist who went to visit a dear friend of hers, only to find that she was weeping inconsolably. When asked what was troubling her, the woman held up a delicate lace handkerchief of exquisite beauty, which had, been of, which had great sentimental value, as it had been passed down from mother to mother, uh, from mother to daughter for generations. But in the middle of the handkerchief, there was a fresh ink stain. The artist asked her friend to let her have the handkerchief. Uh, several days later, she returned her friend's handkerchief. When her friend looked at it, she began to weep again. This time, however, tears of joy. For the artist had drawn on the handkerchief a design of great beauty, completely covering up the ink stain. Now it was more beautiful and more valuable than ever. I see in that story an, an analogy of the grace of God. Humanity was created in exquisite beauty, or as the Bible puts it, in the image of God. Human sin stained the beautiful creation. And yet, in the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord, we are transformed into something even more beautiful. My problem, however, is that sometimes when I look at myself, all I can see is the stain. I don't think I'm the only one who feels that way either. For all of our talk about the love of God and God's peace, with peace which surpasses understanding, there are still times when we have difficulty accepting the truth that such good news actually applies to us as well. It's easy to look at ourselves and see all the flaws. We don't need anyone to point out our sins of uh, commission and omission because we know them all too well. What is far more difficult to see, however, is the handiwork of God. This really hit home last week as I studied our readings for this morning. Much has been written about the ungrateful murmuring against God and Moses and how we all are often ungrateful. In recent years, there has been a certain amount of debate as to whether or not God's judgment was a little harsh. But somehow many scholars overlooked the gracious provision of God in the story of the bronze serpent that Moses was charged to make. Oh, the bronze serpent is discussed, but the debate centers on whether God, who had expressly prohibited the make making of graven images in the Ten Commandments, would then turn around at a later date and authorize the crafting of such an image. There is some speculation that this may have been a story made up to give uh, divine justification for a human invention, because during the reign of the king he uh, Hezekiah, this bronze serpent, which had become an idol, was removed from the temple and destroyed. By and large, however, the main thing missing in such debates is the notion that ultimately God chose grace over condemnation, redemption over destruction, and to remain true to God's covenant than to ban abandon God's chosen people. In like manner, there is much discussion of how to use the words of John's gospel. People love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, and very little about how God sent God's Son not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
Then we come to Ephesians, where we read, You were dead through the trespasses and sins which you once lived, following the course of the world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work amongst those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them, among them in the passions of our flesh, following the de desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. Had Paul simply chosen to dwell on the past in these verses, I think we would all agree that there's no hope for any of us. Thankfully, however, Paul did not stop there because God did not stop there. By grace, we have been saved. God's unmerited favor has been poured out on all humanity in such abundance that it cannot even be measured. In Jesus Christ, we have been redeemed and reconciled. What this means is, is that when God looks at you or me or anyone else, God does not see the countless ways any of us fall short or fail to measure up. God, God does not see the evil we are all capable of committing. God does not see the shameful aspects we tried so hard to keep concealed. In short, God sees above the stain. Beyond uh, that is the point Paul is making in these verses. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. We are what God has made us. A more literal translation of the Greek is that we are God's masterpiece. If ever there were a place where such language would resound, it would have been Ephesus. A primary pagan city, a primarily pagan city, through with a Jewish with a Jewish Jewish synagogue, Ephesus was a city renowned for its artistic creations of miniature shrines to the goddess Artemis. It isn't difficult to imagine that these artisans, then as now, would have taken a great pride in their work. But even more compelling than that sense of pride would have been the fact that such creations were their livelihoods. Luke reports in the book of Acts that Paul encountered resistance in Ephesus precisely because of this very thing, and that such resistance eventually led to a riot in the city. Herein lies the context of the former state of Ephesians. But through the grace of God and Jesus Christ our Lord, the Ephesians were viewed as God's masterpiece. And so are we. Believe it or not, this is a pretty radical thing to assert. I would even go so far as to say there's a great risk in viewing ourselves as God's masterpiece as a result of God's grace. Consider the ramifications if we, if we say in all humility, but also with great certainty, that as recipients of God's grace, we are indeed God's masterpiece. Last week we heard that we were just fooling ourselves if we think we can just blend in and be faithful disciples precisely because we are called to stand out, stand apart, and bear witness to the reign of God. Sometimes that means we will appear utterly foolish. And while a masterpiece by its very nature stands out, stands apart, and bears witness to the skill of the one who created it, to say that we are God's masterpiece is to say that God demands more of us than to just stand here and look pretty. We are God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. If we only see the stain, however, it is a lot easier to avoid God's call and claim on our lives. Moses protested that he could not go and demand that Pharaoh release his people, saying that he was not eloquent and that he was a slow of speech and slow of tongue. Isaiah lamented that he was a man of unclean lips, living among a people of unclean lips. Jeremiah protested that he was just a boy. How many times do we find ourselves saying that we are not smart enough or big enough or talented enough to be any use in the kingdom of God? How many times do we focus on what is wrong with us instead of what God has so graciously made for us? How many times is it just easier to refuse to get involved than it is to say that God has a purpose for each and every one of us? If God's grace could, ever, could never or would never apply to the likes of me, then suddenly God has no claim on me. Then nothing is expected of me, but claim the moniker of God's masterpiece and suddenly there is nowhere we can hide. We are what God has made us, and God makes all things well. In Christ, God looks at us and exclaims, behold my masterpiece, and then puts us on display for the entire world to see. But again, this does not mean just standing there and looking pretty. Instead, it means giving food to the hungry. It means giving something to drink to the thirsty. 
It means welcoming the stranger. It means clothing the naked. It means taking care of the sick. It means visiting the prisoner. In ways large and small, it means give, living out the lives we were destined to live. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time that you would please join me and confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which will again will be taken electronically this week. If you head to our website, www.centralpresspb.com, head to the Donate Now link found at the top of the webpage, and you can make your tithe electronically using a check or money order. I don't know if we can use a check. A debit card or, or credit card, I should say. Uh, if you'd like to use a check, uh, feel free to mail that check or money order to uh, 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. Uh, let us pray. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and for your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit. Until that most glorious day, when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend, and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. Uh, now let us go ahead and turn to, um, uh, turn. Uh, let us share our joys and concerns, if there are any. I know that there are several. Um, we were asked to continue to pray for the Watson Chapel School District as they continue to deal with the um, passing of uh, Dalen Burnett. Uh, we want to continue to keep uh, Mr. Burnett's family in our prayers. Um, we also were asked to continue to keep um, Brad Von Tunglin in our prayers. Uh, Brad spent some time in the hospital uh, uh, ER this week. Uh, he was released yesterday and is now at home recovering. Uh, it seems that uh, things are going well for, uh, for him, for all of his uh, issues. Uh, they seem to have found some kind of bacteria that was in his um, uh, stomach that was causing a lot of the problems. Um, we will also continue to uh, keep Dominic in our prayers. Uh, we also want to continue to keep uh, Haley Chandler in our prayers. Um, we were also asked to... Um, uh, I was also asked to mention the um, the egg hunt that is going to be taking place on uh, the Sunday of Palm or um, yeah Palm Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, as we get more details about that event, I will pass those along via our social media channels. Um, and with that, I think that is everything. Um, let's see. I th yep, I think that's it. Uh, all right. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact the same today as he was yesterday and will be for all of our tomorrows. Uh, please keep in your care uh, Brad Von Tunglin, um, Dominic Munn, and Haley Chandler as they continue to uh, deal with uh, uh, various medical ailments. Uh, please continue to keep the family of uh, Dale and Burnett in your caring. Uh, please continue to keep uh, the Watson Chapel School District, the children, the teachers, and the staff um, there uh, in your caring. Uh, please protect them from further harm, and uh, please let them uh, continue their uh, schoolwork 
um, uninterrupted in the coming days. Uh, please continue to keep all of those who have contracted the coronavirus um, in your care. Uh, please heal those individuals. Uh, please protect those who are uh, assisting those individuals, the doctors, the nurses, and all those medical staff. Uh, we want to continue to pray for, for our frontline workers, uh, those who are um, uh, dealing with people who might have coronavirus, the, the firefighters, police, um, retail workers, um, correctional officers, um, and all of those uh, in the public. Uh, we pray for a speedy delivery of the vaccine. Uh, we pray that those who are able to get the vaccine heed the call and roll up, uh, roll up their sleeve and get their vaccine. Uh, we pray that we return to what we recognize as normal as soon, although we need to uh, take the lessons that we have learned uh, these past 12 months and apply them to our new normal. Um, we ask that you uh, reconcile us uh, to uh, your will and that we hear your word and that we respond accordingly. God of light and truth, you are beyond our grasp or conceiving. Before the brightness of your presence, the angels veil their faces. With lowly reverence and adoring love, we acclaim your glory and sing your praise. For you have shown us your truth and love in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Almighty God, you raised, from, raised Jesus from the grave and opened the way to eternal life. We praise you that you are a God who is free to act, strong to redeem, and loving in all your ways. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Taking today's message with you and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>